All right, are you guys able to see the screen this time easier? Yep. yep. Awesome. Yay! <laughs> so you just see the screen, right? You don't see me? Yeah. Perfect. The little light's not on, so I was assuming that was the case. <laughs> okay, we are back. All right. All right, so the next thing that we talk about is the key terms in child development. You've got development, growth, and maturation. Development, of course, is a progressive increase in the function of the body. Growth is an increase in physical size that's measured in feet or meters or pounds or kilograms. And maturation is the total way in which a person grows and develops as um, dictated by inheritance. How does that person mature, okay? And of course, these terms are important for us as nurses to understand because it's gonna decide how we assess our patients, um, how we look at their development, where they're at in that process, and so on, okay? Um, you have stages of growth and development that your book talks about. For example, you know, a fetus would be the ninth gestational week to birth. Neonate is from birth to four weeks of age. Infant is from four weeks to one year old. Then you move to toddler, which is from one to three years. Preschool is three to six years. School age is six to 12 years. And then your adolescence is 12 to 18 years of age, okay? This is a picture that your book uses that talks about cephalocaudal and proximal distal that allows you to understand what these terms mean. And it's actually um, listed in your book. There's one picture is on page 357, and it allows you to just, you know, look at the different ways that we do our measurements and so on. Um, there are some examples, for example, of what would, if you hear the term cephalocaudal development, um, what would that mean? That would be like raising the head and chest, which would precede the patient, the child sitting, and then sitting precedes standing, and so on. Okay, so cephalocaudal development, again, you would be talking about that raising their head and chest, and then they would begin sitting, and then they would go from sitting to standing. So it's that progression, if you will. Does that make sense? You said this is on page 357. It shows the actual picture of the baby, the development of their muscular control that proceeds from head to foot, which is cephalocaudally, and from the center of the body to its peripheral, which is proximal distal. Okay, so yeah, it's figure 15.1. It shows the little naked baby laying there with the arrows. And that's where it just shows you. It's just directional patterns to kind of show you how that little baby's body develops. Okay. So, for example, we were talking about cephalocaudal. Well, proximal distal, that means it begins at the center portion of the body and then extends outward towards the extremities. For example, your infant grasps with their hands before developing the little pincer grasps. Um, or the infant bats at an object before being able to actually grasp it. Right. So, like, you know, at first they're like waving their hands all around and then all of a sudden they get more and more fine um, motor skills where they're able to pick up a Cheerio, right? So they don't go from just not being able to to just picking it up. There's like a progression that goes outward, okay? Lori? Yes. Um, how do I turn on the captions? Because I try doing it. Um, I, some, I usually take notes. Um, and there are some words that I, you know, I for the spelling too, or for like just for writing it down. Um, I not, can't turn it on. I'm not sure what you mean by turning on the captions or subtitles. I mean just for me talking. Uh, or maybe I'm saying it wrong. It's the it's the so whatever you're speaking, um, I can read it too. Like gosh. Someone correct me if I'm wrong. I, yeah, I, um, I know it. when um, it's like right next to the camera button, it goes, it has CC on it and you push it. It should just be in the same spot where you turned it on. Hang on, let me oh, see it. Oh, oh, for you guys are able to do that? 
Uh, yeah, yeah, the Commander's Room camera, it has CC in a box, and this is turn on captions, and then it says that Lori Worley is presenting. Okay, so right sorry. Right. Does it actually print the words that I'm saying? Yeah. Really? I didn't know that it did that. <laughs> I just kind of have hard time sometimes with some wording. It's um, okay. So it help to, like, I don't want to watch another video just to turn those on, yeah. but it helps. Thank you so much, you guys. No problem. And does it allow you to download that? No. I, okay. I don't know. Okay. But, uh, I just have never seen that. That's cool. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> um, let me see if it goes to the next one. So my video is pausing. It's just, there we go. Um, let me just move forward here. So you have different growth standards and we use growth charts to look at those standards. So children who are in good health tend to follow a consistent pattern of growth. At any age there, again, of course, are wide individual differences in those measured values depending on the child, right? And there are separate charts for boys and girls. And again, those are adjusted based off of growth values, okay? So this shows you, if you look at the pink circle on the blue box and the blue circle on the pink box, it shows you where you would chart the different things that we are watching, okay? So it allows us to see at what percentage that child falls for normal growth development. So for example, if let's say we had a little baby and we're doing their head measurements and their head is just not growing, or it's growing super, super fast, you know, and you're thinking, wow, something's off here. You would be able to note that, you know, when you're looking at these charts, like, wow, they're at the zero percentile or lower, or they're way above, you know, and so those kind of things would be able to be noted when you come in with that. So again, the reason why we have those growth standards is to compare the measurement of a child to others of the same age and sex and um, the child's present measurements with their former rate of growth and pattern so that we can look at the progress they're making, okay? So we would look at, just like we look at weight and height, you set those, the one from the visit before to the one now and say, oh, wow, look at they've made progress. They are developing at a normal rate. Okay, so we're able to not only compare against other kids, but looking back at that patient themselves and seeing what kind of progress that they've made. Okay. Um, also, when children are under the age of two, we also do a horizontal measurement or length because we're measuring that as well. Okay. Um, developmental screening. Uh, Denver Developmental Screening Test, this assesses the development status of children during their first six years of life in four categories, personal and social, personal social, fine motor, adaptive, language, and gross motor. And the purpose is to identify children unable to perform at an age-appropriate level. Okay, it's not an intelligence test, but again, it's to identify children who are unable to perform at an age-appropriate level right? So let's say we're doing this on a child that's four years of age, and they come out showing that they're at the level of a 12-month-old. That would be concerning, right? And so it would allow us to see where they're at in those stages to know what we could do to help them, maybe who we need to refer them to, what kind of um, uh, help, if you will, you know, that we can implement with that child. Okay, as early as possible. Some of the influencing factors, all of the following factors are closely related and dependent on one another in their effect on the growth and development of the child. Heredity, nationality and race, their ordinal position within the family, are they the youngest, the oldest, the middle child, so on, right? Uh, their gender and the environment, all of those do play a role, okay? Um, if the child's ill, physically or emotionally, uh, the developmental processes may be delayed. And so that's something that we would want to pay attention to. Um, nationality and race ethnic differences can extend into a lot of different areas, including speech, uh, your child's food preferences, um, 
religious orientation, their code of conduct. So again, you know, your nursing skills, you would want to ascertain the cultural beliefs that that patient and family has, any practices that they have when you're collecting the data for your nursing assessment, okay? Because those always play a role. Um, ordinal position in the family, like youngest and middle children, they tend to learn from their older sisters and brothers. Um, motor development of the youngest um, sometimes can be prolonged if the order of the family is the baby, because a lot of times everybody's doing everything for them. They don't need to talk. They don't need to do things for themselves, right? So it can seem like they're delayed when mostly what it comes out to is that they're just not having to do any of that, right? Um, and that can be very common as well. Um, we laughed just recently about this because my grandbaby is 10 and a half months old and we were talking about different developmental things and they were talking about the fact that um, my son-in-law, they were like, he didn't even talk until he was like two because he never needed to. His sister is a major talker, still is, kind of in control of everything. She talked for him. She carried around. Every time somebody would ask a question, she answered the question for him. So he never had a need to talk. Right. And then all of a sudden when he started talking, he was talking in full sentences. So it was already there. He just wasn't needing to use it. You know, perfect example. Um, page 359 also talks about sleep patterns. This is another key section you're going to want to review. Look at how they differ per each different age group. There are different sleep patterns for different age groups. Right. Your infant's going to sleep much different, you know, than an eight year old typically. Okay, so look at how those vary as well. Types of families, a lot of different types of families, nuclear, extended, single parent, foster parent. Um, let's go through a few of these, okay? And you're gonna need to know these, um, uh, know the differences between them and recognize them. These are on page 363. Um, know how they um, differ and you know, they're gonna have different effects on your children, particularly school age. Nuclear, Traditional family is the family that has the husband, wife, children, whether natural or adopted. You've got your extended. Um, what yeah. page is it? Uh, 363. Thank you. Sure. Um, your extended family would be things where you're including grandparents, parents, children, relatives, and so on. Single parent would be where a woman or a man establishes a separate household through individual preference, like maybe through divorce, death, illegitimacy, desertion, anything like that. Foster would be, uh, foster parent parents would be those who care for children um, that require parenting because of a dysfunctional family, no family, or maybe individual problems. Um, you have got alternative type families where these are communal families, maybe multiple families live together in a commune or community setting. A dual career, this is where both parents work outside the home because of a desire or a need. You've got your blended family. This is where you'll have particularly, they refer to it as like remarriage of persons with children or, you know, two people that have children coming together and now they have this blended family of kids from both sides. Um, polygamous, this is where there's more than one spouse. Uh, homosexual, two persons of the same sex who adopt children or have children from a previous marriage. And you've got cohabitation, heterosexual or homosexual couples who live together but remain unmarried. So as you can see, all different types of families, but they're all still family units. So you wanna be aware of all those different types and be able to recognize those. Then we have what's called the family APGAR. Um, this is used to assess family function, how they adapt, what their partnership looks like, their growth, affection, ability to resolve things. Um, these enable the nurse to develop interventions that aid the family to achieve a healthier adaptation to the child's health needs. Again, um, adaptation, how the family helps and shares their resources. Um, partnership, this is how their lines of communication and partnership work in the family. Okay, uh, growth is how their responsibilities for growth and development of a child are shared. Affection would be overt and covert emotional interactions among your family members. And of course, resolve is how time, money, and space are allocated to prevent and solve problems. Okay, so just a few examples. Like, let's use the last one, resolve. Okay, let's say you have a family that just found out, you know, that their child has some health issues. So they're going to have to look at how they're going to allocate finances and their time to be able to go to doctor's visits and to pay for the treatments that are necessary and things like that. That would fall under resolve. 
Okay. Um, so there are a lot of factors, you know, that have an effect on healthcare that your book talks about. You know, just for example, you know, housing, where, where are the patients and their families located? Do they have access to public transportation and city services? Are they safe? Do they have some sort of healthcare system? Okay. Um, when you discharge that patient, are they going to have community access? So those all affect the family, right? Um, what if they're homeless? You know, that has that can have an impact on the growth and development of a child. Um, a support system and financial resources, a lot of times those are severely lacking. And so sometimes your school emergency nurses are the only ones, you know, that have contact with this child. And they can sometimes be the first ones to identify issues. And sometimes they're, they and or um, school staff, like principals and teachers working with the nurse, um, they're the ones that are able to get community access for like referrals for food or housing or education, even financial assistance, free meals for breakfast and lunch, things like that. Okay, so you can see those can have a really big effect. Now on page 366, 367, it talks about the, the cultural uh, um, influence of the, of the family. So again, we just referred to that a moment ago. You want to look at how each culture's, for example, communication is influenced and how as nurses, we should respect our different patients' cultural beliefs. Just because they're not ours and just because it's not part of our culture doesn't mean it's not vital and very important, you know, that we respect that for a family. Okay. And remember, going back to what we learned in med search, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Basic physio physiological needs have to be met before we can move up that pyramid, right? If they're not safe, if they don't have, you know, those factors in place, they're not really focused on anything else above that, right? So that's important to look at that as well. Another um, key thing that your book talks about um, on page 364 is moving into your patient's personality development, how that happens. And, you know, personality is the result of that interaction between biological and environmental um, heritages. And I like the definition for personality development is that uh, the unique organization of characteristics that determine that individual's typical or recurrent pattern of behavior. That's on page 364, you know? And so again, you know, one's personality is gonna be different than the next person. No two people are alike, right? An individual's personality, again, is that interaction that happens. And then your book begins to start talking about different theories. So we have theorists. They're called developmental theorists. We've got Erickson, Freud, Piaget, Kohlberg, and Maslow. You recognize a few of those, I'm sure. Um, and I have put the videos that are here. They're on your Moodle page for today under videos. So you can access, access those videos if you'd like to watch them. You know, just real helpful with pediatrics to understand these de developmental stages because we refer to them a lot in peds. You know, I like this picture right here, for example, when we talk about Erickson's, like a little baby's crying, you know, and they're, they're little, all they know in their world is, is somebody going to come help me? If nobody comes and helps them, it can really develop mistrust in them. But if somebody does come to help them, that builds trust that there's going to be somebody there. So you can see, for example, at a really young age, how that would get developed in a child. Okay, so Erickson's, Erickson's stages of child development demonstrate the various tasks that must be mastered at each age to achieve what's called optimum maturity. And each stage builds on the successful completion of the previous stage. Kind of sounds like Maslow, doesn't it? The achievement of the tasks of childhood doesn't occur in isolation. Parents have to interact appropriately and assist. Freud we all love Freud. He's crazy. Not my favorite, but okay. <laughs> this is where he um, talks about children going through a series of psychosexual stages that lead to the development of the adult personality. Um, cognition is talking about how our brain functions to know things. It refers to intellectual ability. Okay? Children are born with inherited potential, but that potential has to be developed, right? Um, opportunities for successful exploration enhance that child's cognitive development. The development of logical thinking, conceptual understanding is really complex. So Piaget is the next one 
who talks about the theory of cognitive development, that intellectual ability. Intellectual maturity is attained through four orderly and distinct stages of development. All of them are interrelated. Sensory motor, pre-operational, concrete operations, and formal operations. So when you look at those, you know, when you're reading on those four, look at what the differences are. What do they mean? Okay, so for example, operational thinking would be like cause and effect. Like, I'm in trouble because I didn't listen. They're able to relate why they're in trouble, right? It's a cause and effect. That would be a, a perfect picture of that operational thinking, okay? The ages for each stage are approximate. They each build on each other. Some kids are going to hit it earlier than others, right? Um, it consists of interactions and coping with the environment around them, okay? Kohlberg is another one. Kohlberg has um, the theory of moral development. Um, his theory is based, it's sequential, based off of Piaget's findings. He has three levels, pre-conventional, conventional, and post-conventional. And at each level, it has two stages. The emphasis here is on the conscious of the individual within a society. Okay, And again, it'll really help you if you want to look at um, those videos. It'll break those down for you. Okay. I'm going to move forward here a little bit. Your book also, as we go through um, this section, talks about several parent teaching sections. Um, you have experiences in dealing with challenges and disappointments um, to prepare the child to function independently in childhood. So, you know, some of the things that parents do can either encourage or make it harder right, for kids to develop different stages or different tools, you know. Um, one example that your book uses, for example, when kids are little, you know, we can create a lot of anxiety in our kids. Like maybe they're learning to ride a bike for the first time and we're like, don't fall, don't fall. Oh, don't do that. Don't do that. You might hit your head. Don't do that. And all of a sudden we've created this really anxious child, right? And it talks about little different skills and parent teaching that we can work with parents on what's normal, what's not normal, and how we can encourage those stages. So, for example, you know, encouraging the child to deal with successes and failures, providing socially acceptable outlets for them, um, intervening only if the frustrations become overwhelming. For example, letting the child work through it themselves, not doing it for them, because we're causing them to ask the questions and find the answers. We're teaching them to be able to critically think, right, instead of just not being patient and letting them work on it themselves, right? Patient, the parent's task is to provide the child with skills and tools appropriate for each age level to deal with the current events. It's kind of like sitting back, giving them the tools they need, and then watching them work through it. And that's really good for them to be able to do. And your book does a really good job of breaking it down from the toddler to the preschooler and so on right? For example, you know, with a little toddler, you know, between a year and three years of age, they're learning autonomy. How can they start doing things that mommy or daddy doesn't have to do for them? And then encouraging that, you know, and letting them work through it. That's okay. Okay. But your book does that. It breaks down each age group. If you want to read through those, um, they can be really handy. But again, talking about Erickson's um, stages again, and Piaget's, you know, it looks at again, their maturity and their intellectual ability, you know, and how those are broken down. The next thing that we talk about uh, is nutritional heritage. Um, some families don't consider food a priority right? Um, a lack of adequate nutrition, as you know, and or you may not know, can actually lead to mental retardation because the brain is actually lacking those key essential components that are necessary for that brain to develop appropriately. Um, obese children, they may be subject to decreased motor skills, peer rejection. So of course, that can take them to a whole different level of things they have to deal with. So the nurse identifies children at risk and assists the family in modifying their eating habits to ensure they're getting adequate nutrition um, that's provided for growth and development. So let me give you an example on one way you could do this. You could be talking to the parents and children and ask, you know, maybe you have a child that's very overweight. Um, 
I actually, I'll give you an example of a child that I worked with when I was um, working with the TB clinic for a child who was getting treatment. And he was also part of our well child exams. And sadly, he was very, very obese for his age. He was probably, I think he was somewhere between seven and nine years of age, probably weighed what a late age teenager would be. Um, but the, the family members that were with him, I think he was with his grandparents said, oh, he won't drink anything but soda for his beverages and he'll only eat junk food. And they even talked about it. Like they literally said, yeah, he probably drinks eight to 10 sodas a day, cans of soda and, you know, several bags of chips and all this. And so we began to educate them on his health in a very kind way on, you know, this is going to cause severe issues. So working on working with the child and then working with the family on providing, you know, the right kinds of foods for him, you know, so that we could, you know, begin to make that shift to take him down the right path, if you will. I want to throw in a keynote, um, Kohlberg's theory that we talked about, page 371. Um, has table 15.3. Make sure you study that one, particularly paying attention to Kohlberg. Okay. I don't want to miss that one for you guys. Family nutrition, of course, is important as well. You, uh, you want to make sure and, you know, look at the fact that we've got the USDA dietary guidelines. These are in, intended to help parents make good informed decisions decisions and how to come up with a well-balanced diet that supplies all of those needs. Okay. When we look at food itself, it provides heat and energy. It builds and repairs tissues. It regulates our body processes and it's, it's given in a mixture of elements, minerals, compounds, and water. And what we have to remember as we are, you know, teaching you know, parents and their family is, it's just like what you put in your car. You know, if you're putting really bad supply in it, your motor is going to wear out. It's going to have issues. And so, you know, we really want to help, you know, families understand how important it is, you know, to have good food. Um, fiber is another big one uh, for kids, high fiber foods. Um, they can be good, but they can also fill the stomach really fast, right? And then provide very few nutrients and calories needed for an active and growing child. Um, high fiber foods, they can cause increased loss of calcium, zinc, magnesium, and iron in the stool that may necessitate them needing supplements, okay? A diet containing meat, poultry, or fortified foods would lessen the chance of nutrient deficiency. So tell me how a family's financial status could affect the child's health on what they need. It's cheaper to eat like junky. Like if you go to McDonald's, you can get like two McDoubles or whatever for $3 or a salad for like eight or whatever. So, right. Exactly. It's like, if you go to the store, you know, it's so much cheaper, you know, for example, I mean, my family, my husband grew up in New Mexico and we love Mexican food. It's like, it's one of our staples, right? And so, you know, if you make a pot of beans and a big thing of rice, you know, high fiber, starchy, very filling, right? But probably not getting all the nutrients of that if you're not incorporating some of those fresher foods and lean meats and things, right? And so it can be hard to learn that balance. And those fresh foods are just they're, it's just a reality. They're a lot more expensive, right? Well, that and companies tend to market. They aim for children. They make pretty labels and cartoon characters and all the flavors. Right. And stuff. That's such a good point. And and where are those things located in the store? At the right. checkout stand. <laughs> at the checkout stand or right at a child's eye level. Have you ever walked down the cereal aisle? All the really healthy ones are like way on the very top. And where are all your sugary ones with all those cartoon images? They're right at a child's level, right? It's so true. They market it so well. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a big one. Um, we also need to understand that you have a lot of different things that change as the children develop. Like, for example, when we look at the digestive system of the newborn, it's very immature. It functions very minimally 
for the first three months of life. Saliva is very minimal, which we know that digestion starts in the mouth with the saliva. So it's very minimal with a baby because they don't need it yet. Hydrochloric acid and renin in the stomach and trypsin found in the intestines um, aid in the digestion of milk because that's typically all they should be getting. Uh, the physiology of the digestive tract is the basis for introduction of various foods during that first year of life. You know, and they don't, now, I do know babies who've been born with a tooth or two, um, very rare, but, you know, typically you're not seeing teeth until after four months, you know, and so because of that, you know, they're, they're, even how their body's developing, it wasn't made to process things yet. There's a lot of patients that'll be like, oh, they're two months old, I want them to sleep longer, so I'm gonna give them cereal with their milk, not realizing that their body can't even quite handle it yet because it doesn't have those, those things present in their body that would process it you know, like it needs to be processed. So they have to be introduced very slowly, okay? And liver function is much more minimal in a baby you know, than it is in an adult or a, even a small child. Um, to help prevent some illnesses, it's not recommended uh, to significantly restrict fat and cholesterol with kids because they're needed for calories and for the development of the central nervous system. So we can kind of get skewed with all of the health fads that are out there and go, oh, well, they can't have any of this because that's bad for them, not realizing that they do need a certain amount in order for their central nervous system to develop properly. Uh, nutritional needs may be changed because of the severity of an illness. Uh, total parental nutrition, TPN, and intro feedings allow children who need nutritional support to be cared for at home, for example, instead of, you know, needing to go elsewhere. Um, well, there was a couple, something else I was going to talk about. Um, Oh, for example, you know, like when we look at our infants, let me come back here. When we look at our infants, you know, for example, it talk, talks about this somewhere around, well, the pages might be off. I won't give you the page numbers on this one. But for example, with infants, they require more calories, more protein, minerals, vitamins, and fluids. Okay. Um, usually like rice cereal is one of the first solid foods that's introduced it's usually recommended to be introduced at six months of age um you introduce one food at a time wait four days in between why we want to rule out allergies are they do they process it okay is their body doing okay with it give it a full four days to kind of run the course of are they doing okay you know before we introduce another one okay um And so it's really interesting, like your book even talks about certain things like spinach and broccoli and beets, you know, how like because of their nitrate levels, you know, like not processing those at home for infants because of it can cause um, uh, methemoglobinemia in adults. But most fresh uh, and frozen unsalted foods would be completely appropriate, you know, for little kids. You also want to watch babies for any symptoms of being underfed. Are they restless? Are they crying? Are they failing to gain weight? Maybe they're not getting enough food or enough nutrients. We would want to make sure and pay attention to that. Just like we would look at the opposite. Are they being overfed? You know, like, are they having regurgitation or mild diarrhea? Are they rapidly, rapidly gaining weight? Right? So those would be some things, you know, to pay attention to as well. Um, Again, you're looking at some of the causes, um, you know, some of the issues that we deal with. Childhood obesity, of course, it's more than doubled in the past 30 years. Uh, for ages 6 to 11 years of age, it's increased from 7% in 1980 to 18% in 2010. That's crazy. And it is related to obesity in adulthood. So when our kids struggle with it as a child, it tends to follow them into adult adulthood, which is why it is really important to address it at a young age and find out what the causes are. Um, it can cause health problems in adulthood like high cholesterol, high blood pressure. Um, most often it's related to diet and inactivity. Uh, the body mass index, the BMI percentile, takes the weight in pounds, height in inches, squared, times 703 and it allows you to break that down so look at that calculation in your reading um, so you understand it at least um, one of the things that we recommend um, for example with babies is 
Um, especially particularly it's great if they're nursing, if a mom can do that, if they're not, there's some great formulas out there, but, um, prior to one year of age, they recommend not introducing whole milk to a baby before a year of age and not introducing low fat milk until, um, before they're two years of age. Again, they need those normal, healthy fats in their diet. Okay. Um, Breast milk or non or iron fortified formula is the food of choice during those first six months to one year of life. Introducing baby food uh, before the age of four to sixty months, four to six months really doesn't serve any nutritional value because their body's not able to get out of it what a child older than that's body processes are able to accomplish. Okay. So when we talk about the ill child, you know, feeding the ill child, um, many hospitalized children have poor appetites, right? They don't feel good and um, they don't want to eat. And the cause can really vary depending on whatever illness or disease that they have. Uh, they may also refuse food as a means of manipulating their parents. Like, I'm just not going to eat because, you know, the way of controlling, right? Everything else in their little world's out of control. So this is the one thing they can control. Remember that, that can be really helpful. Um, so your nurse should assess, does the child have any teeth? Are there any lesions, in the, you know, any sores, anything in the mouth that would cause it to be painful for them to eat? And can they eat independently or do they need assistance? You know, you don't want to put a plate of food in front of the child, they don't eat, and you go, oh, you weren't hungry and take it away, not realizing that they couldn't eat. You know, so those would be important things to assess. Uh, now, uh, it says a tablespoon of food for each year of age is good to follow when feeding a child. They actually did this slide wrong. It should say a tablespoon of food from each food group for each age, e each year of age is a good guide to follow when feeding a child. Can you imagine giving a three-year-old one tablespoon, of, uh, three tablespoons of food? <laughs> Doesn't quite add up, does it? Uh, sweet drinks and snacks, they should not be served just before meals because, of course, it fills them up, gives them something that's not as nutritious. You want their tummy to be, you know, able to um, eat something, you know, healthy first before we fill their tummy up with sugary sweets and things like that. Um, infants who are placed on an NPO status or nothing by mouth should be provided with a pacifier also to meet their sucking needs because that is a big issue for infants and it can really soothe them. It can make them feel more secure. They'll rest easier. So make sure you pay attention to that. If they can't have anything by mouth, make sure that they're getting, you know, that, that need met by at least having a pacifier. Okay. Okay. So again, tablespoon of food per food group, not heaping, just a normal tablespoon for each year of age. That's your good guide to follow. So just remember that. Okay. Another thing we look at are food drug interactions. You've got drug to drug, which of course the nurse needs to know the side effects of each drug that's prescribed and administered. So we're not going to have an issue between a couple of drugs that we're giving. A drug in the environment would involve interaction um, of the effects of a drug on the response of the patient to the environment. Uh, for example, certain drugs like or antibiotics like doxycycline, for example, can cause pronounced photosensitivity. So you'd want to tell them to avoid being out in the light or the sun. So the drug may have environmental re reactions. And then you've got your drug and food interactions where the nurse needs to know if any foods are contraindicated when the child is receiving certain drugs. For example, Coumadin and foods containing high levels of vitamin K. Or another really big one is if you're giving your patient iron, you're going to want to limit like egg, yolk, egg yolks and starch because with little kids, their body tends to bind to that and it doesn't allow their iron to be absorbed like it needs to be. So that becomes an issue. That's key to remember those food and drugs interactions. And of course, we have those lovely little teeth. Um, it's very important not to neglect baby teeth. Uh, the deciduous teeth, which are your baby teeth, serve not only in the digestive process, but also in the development of the child's jaw. If those teeth are lost too early, then the permanent teeth can come in poorly aligned. Okay, delayed or early eruption can be indicative of certain endocrine disorders. 
um, or other pathologic conditions as well. So we wanna pay attention to those as well. That's very important. Um, and again, it's really important not to neglect those baby teeth because again, you know, if they're not getting brushed and things and they end up with like little dental caries, which we'll talk about, you know, it can actually damage the permanent teeth underneath them, which can cause really severe issues. Um, when we're talking about oral care and health and illness, interestingly enough, your sticky foods actually have more potential to cause your dental caries or cavities than do sugar drinks. They say things that can just rinse off are better than things that actually stick between the tooth teeth. <laughs> so for example, some foods to avoid, sugared gum, dried fruits, sugared soft drinks, cake, and candy, because those things tend to stick in and around the teeth. Recommended snack foods would be things like cheese, milk, sugarless gum, raw veggies, things like that. Um, always encouraging kids to brush after each meal and snack. Um, eating a healthy, balanced diet also, of course, enhances that tooth development as well. Your dental caries are cavities. These occur when the infant fall, can occur, I should say, when infants fall asleep while breastfeeding or they're being put to bed with a bottle of milk or sweetened juice. Uh, the sugar actually pools in the oral cavity and stays around those teeth. This is most often seen in children 18 months of age to three years of age. We'd want to really try to avoid that. How you guys doing? We're getting about 10 minutes away from a break, okay? When we talk about educating on tooth hygiene, that should start with the very first tooth that comes through. Uh, brushing the teeth before bedtime, pr protective bactericidal effects of saliva actually decrease during sleep. So when you're up during the day, you have your saliva that has that bactericidal effect. Um, but when we go to sleep, I'm sorry. Must have just gotten hit. Um, so, but when we're sleeping, those effects go down, which is again, why you don't want to put a baby to bed with milk or juice or what have you, because it just kind of stays around their teeth. Um, fever is not associated with teething. I disagree, but hey. So the cause should be assessed. Okay, so this has been around, it's the controversy for years and years and years. You can ask any mom, how many of you moms or dads have had kids and would tell me that your child had a fever while they were teething? Yeah, my baby gets hot right now, he's teething. Yeah. I mean. yeah, anybody else? I agree. Hey, they, yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah, right? I have a grandbaby who typically, and we'll talk about this, um, kids by the time they hit a year old, usually the, the rule of thumb is they've got two teeth on the bottom, four teeth on the top. That would be a total of six teeth by about a year old. My grandbaby is 10 and a half months. She has four on top, four on the bottom, and two more cutting through right now. So she's going to town on cutting teeth, and the fever has been a roller coaster. And every time that tooth's about to pop through. Now, so here's my theory per book knowledge, and you will have pedi some pediatricians that will say, teething doesn't cause fevers. And then you have other pediatricians who are like, yes, they do. We all know they do. <laughs> so the part that makes me laugh is it's an inflammatory process, right? The gums get swollen for that tooth to break through, and inflammatory processes cause fever. That's just. One, not always, but that's why it cracks me up when they say that can't be causing it. Well, coincidentally, every time my children broke teeth through, they had a fever. <laughs> and no, I'm not going to trick you and test you on that. <laughs> but I think it's funny that it's always listed as, and there's another part in the book about teething that says, it's not usually uncomfortable or painful at all. I'm like, who wrote this book? <laughs> who wrote that? So not true. If you've ever had a screaming baby up all night because they're trying to cut teeth through, you know that that's not the case. The book said that teething's un not uncomfortable. Yeah, there's a part that says it's not usually that uncomfortable, you know. And I'm thinking, how many of you remember when you had a tooth cutting through or a wisdom tooth cutting through? I don't know about you, but it hurt like crazy. I could hardly chew on anything, right? No, it's no joke. Yeah, it is not a joke. So it cracks me up when they say that, but.
Um, replace toothbrush every three months or after a viral illness because, of course, we don't want to spread bacteria. Okay. Um, they say to avoid rinsing the bristles in hot water because you don't, it's just like when you're doing dishes, they recommend not rinsing a sponge with hot water and then setting it down when you're done because you've created a temperature for bacterial growth, right? Um, that would be the, the reasoning behind that. You don't want to use a closed container for toothbrush storage because it allows bacteria to grow. It's not dry. It can't air out. And then, of course, the obvious, avoid sharing toothbrushes because, of course, you can transmit bacteria and so on. Okay. The last thing we talk about is play. Play is what we call the work of children and they need it. It's really, really important. Um, hospital playrooms are used by children who don't have communicable diseases. For example, measles or a draining wound or something like that. Um, art can allow for creative expression. You've also got computer games. Um, nursing interventions should focus on encouraging optimal play activities that are age appropriate and helping parents select age and illness appropriated toys. Okay. Um, one thing that's recommended is you don't give children with asthma stuffed animals because, of course, they can collect dust and dander and all kinds of stuff. And so, of course, it can make breathing harder, you know, so that's one of the things you'd want to be careful with. But, you know, you can do things like therapeutic play, like having a child blow out um, the light of a flashlight as if it were a candle in order to, for example, promote deep breathing, right? So you turn it into a game. Kids love games and they really need them. And um, I think it's table 1510. I think that's the one that's on the developmental play um, table. Those are great things. I mean, when you can turn anything into a game, it makes it so much more fun for your child. And remember, again, if you're decreasing that child's stress, then that body has less oxygen demand. It's able to function better. And what's the big thing? It's actually able to heal better, right? So if that child is screaming and stressed the whole time they're there, their body can't heal, right? So we want to do whatever we can to make them comfortable, have their family close to them, Anything that we can do that's going to decrease their stress, help encourage their developmental stages, you know, anything like that can be really, really helpful with our babies. So those are important things to pay attention to. Okay. Let's see. Can you guys see me? Can you see me again now? Yes. Okay. okay. So that is chapter 15. Do you have any questions on anything we covered? Kind of a straightforward chapter with babies, you know, but um, yeah, it's pretty fascinating. Uh, let me, let me just throw out a couple questions and then I'm going to let you go to break in about two minutes. Okay. Um, and then we'll jump into our second chapter for today. Let's see. I had one I was going to ask you. Okay, give me, throw out a name of a different kind of family. Family units. What, what are some Nucular. different? Blended. 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 Nucular. Brady Bunch. Nucular. Did you, somebody say Brady Bunch? <laughs> Blended. <laughs> Dual career. Good. Good. Oh. Good. Good. Yeah, foster. Yeah, absolutely. Good. So lots of different kinds of families. Be able to identify those. Does culture affect a child? Yes. And what do we do about it as nurses? <laughs> right? We basically learn about what is their culture and how to approach them. Go with the flow. Absolutely. Yeah, go with the flow. Puberty is most important when you're growing up, right? I'm sorry, Janet? Oh, I was telling you what I learned. Oh, good, good. Yeah, I think it's really, culture is a really big one because you don't want to come in and offend a family. Do you think they're going to really have much to listen to with you if you're offending them? No. Or if you tell them, well, you shouldn't be doing that and it's part of their culture, that's very offensive, right? 
So what you want to do is incorporate their culture into their care as much as possible. Now, if it's contraindicated, like let's say they want to bring their family member food that is not, it's going to make it worse. Then that's when we'd have to step in and say, you know, I know the rest of the time this is okay, but right now with the condition that they're dealing with, this is probably not a good idea. For example, let's say you have a culture that, you know, one of the primary things in their diet is a lot of fried food. Okay. And you have a patient who's dealing with some really severe tummy stuff going on. You're not going to be wanting them to give that child a bunch of fried food, right? Because it's going to irritate it. It's going to make it worse. It's not going to, you know, and so on. So you might say, you know, I know this might be, you know, part of the regular diet, but right now it would probably be good if we stick with some low residue foods so that their tummy can actually heal. This might actually aggravate it. You follow me? You're, you're finding out like sometimes there are things culturally that are going to make it worse in any culture because, you know, it's not, it may not be appropriate all the time. Diet can be a really big one with that, right? Where you're like, okay, the rest of the time this might be okay, but right now while they're sick, it's probably not a good idea. Or maybe it's a food drug thing you know, where you're like, you know, we, the patient's really anemic and we've got them on iron and they're wanting to bring in, you know, scrambled eggs every day and egg yolks can be an issue, you know, with the absorption of iron. So that might not be a good idea right now. Follow me. So those are some, you know, good things to look at. Okay. All right, guys, I'm going to give you a 10 minute break. And um, then we will come back and jump into chapter 22. And um, that's actually I think it's a little bit shorter chapter, so I will see you back in 10 minutes.